Thank you all for sticking around this uh, late in the day. So, as Paul mentioned, we'll talk about the status of olive flounder, a commercially ready species in terms of the classifications that we've been talking about today. So a little background on the fish. Uh, it's a temperate marine species. It's native to Northwest Pacific Ocean. It's one of the left-eyed flounders. Uh, they split up the flounders, left-eyed, right-eyed. So it's a left-eyed species of flounder. <clears throat> Has white meat, firm consistency. So it's very desirable uh, to a number of chefs, high-end restaurants. It's well known. Uh, it's good for a variety of culinary presentations, sushi, sashimi. Uh, cooked products, it has a collagen-rich texture, and has a very delicate flavor profile. So uh, you know, chefs greatly pre uh, prefer to use this fish for a variety of preparations. And it's one of the most important commercial farm-raised fish in Eastern Asia, Korea, Japan, and China, as we'll get into. Production history, uh, there is a wild catch of this species. So the amount of that wild catch that actually started its life in the hatchery, that's debatable. Uh, but they do catch them in the wild there. So uh, they have a strong stock enhancement program over there for the species. Uh, you can see on the bottom panel there, the beginnings back in the late eight, mid to late 80s of uh, farm production of the species from FAO. And in terms of the South Korean production, South Korea is a leader in producing the species worldwide. So industrial scale production began in South Korea in about 1989 for the species. They use land-based production. So they have underground seawater supplies, uh, provides about a steady 16 to 18 degrees C throughout the year. And this reduces their heating costs. Again, this is a temperate species, cooler water species, and some of the others we've talked about, like the cobia, for instance. Uh, they sometimes mix this underground seawater with coastal seawater to get that right temperature profile. And they have ideal growth temperatures of 21 to 24 degrees C. South Korea has a national breeding program that's been underway for a little while now. So it's focused on improved growth rates. They've seen about 30% gains already, uh, focused on disease resistance and preserving genetic diversity. So uh, this is highly relevant to some of the discussions we've had already today in terms of the challenges of working with wild broodstock or F1 broodstock, we have an advantage here in that there's been a significant amount of research on selective breeding with this species, and so that has translated into very high performance for this fish in an aquaculture setting. Within South Korea, the majority of the production occurs on Jeju Island. Uh, over 50% of Korean production is on Jeju Island. They can have year-round production there. <coughs> And they reach the fish reach market size about 1.7 times faster on Jeju Island than in other production locations under those flow through conditions using seawater drawn in from underground wells as well as well as a uh, coastal source. There's over 400 flounder farms on the island. So they're stacked up on the island. If you look at an aerial Google Earth image of it, you can see them stacked up there. It looks like chicken farms stacked up on the island. Uh, provide, they provide about 50% of flounder consumed in Japan and about 95% of flounder exports from Korea originate from Jeju Island. So you see in the bottom right panel there, they actually ship these fish live to the U.S. So they pack these fish up, these modified shipping containers, you can see them there, put them, ship them to the U.S. and they still make money on that fish. So in terms of talking about the economics and which species are, you know, better candidates, if you can pack a fish up live in South Korea, ship it to the U.S. and still make money on that fish, I think that answers the question for this one. Current status, South Korea produces, again, they're the main producer, about 82.5% of global production, almost 50,000 metric tons. So is it commercially ready? Yes, it's commercially ready. It's being done. Uh, Japan, about 17.5%. So over 10,000 metric tons produced. <clears throat> and as far as uh, history of flounder aquaculture at the University of Miami, why in Miami would we be working with a cold water or temperate flounder species? Well, because it's a high value marine fish species and that's sort of what we specialize in there at the university. 
So in October of 2015, we received 32 broodstock fish. They average in size 2.3 to 5 kilos. Uh, we maintain them at about 16 to 18 degrees Celsius water temperature. Three months after receiving them, you see the results. We have uh, <clears throat> mass production of fingerlings there. So compared to the other species we work with at the university, cobia, snapper, grouper, mahi, the larva culture on this one is, is relatively straightforward. The broodstock, UM has the only known broodstock of this species in the United States. And they reach sexual maturity, depends on the water conditions, the growing conditions, but uh, two plus years. Okay. They have volitional spawning. So you see here, that's a daily spawn in those, split between those two beakers, over 1.5 million eggs from our broodstock tank. Water temperatures of 13 to 17 degrees C for spawning. We feed them every other day, natural cut diet, sardines, squid, vitamin supplements. Again, fairly straightforward in terms of, you've seen all the presentations today. There are a lot of similarities between the species in terms of how the broodstock are handled. So with this, there's, there are no uh, tricks in terms of the broodstock diet. There's no formulated diet that we use. Uh, it's sort of our <clears throat> natural diet supplemented with vitamins and minerals. Hatchery and level rearing technology, straightforward. Green water in the early stages, rotifers, artemia, wean them onto micro diets. Beyond that, it's been published. Uh, one of our students, Ja Gang, here at all, you can look up this paper, uh, did a nice study on them looking at you know, low density versus high density culture. A lot of it, a lot of the production traditionally has been done sort of a lower density. We want to see are there any negative impacts of doing it at higher density so you can crank out commercial scale quantities of fingerlings from a smaller hatchery facility, the answer is yes, you can, with no det uh, detrimental effects on the fish. And that's what we see here. You can see sort of the, the different stages, moving through there, yolk sac stage, preflexion, flexion, and metamorphosis. Okay, so great fish to work with. Uh, very different than a number of the other tropical and subtropical teleos we work with. The production cycle, as far as the spawning, Nick, again, this is general. I think Mark mentioned, okay, there's about 100 different recipes you could use to grow a particular species. Same goes for this one, but in, in general, this is a production cycle. Volitional spawns, so no hormone induction needed with this species. Uh, so volitional spawns from these selectively bred broodstock. Hatchery stages last about 45 days, more or less, depending on water temperature. We maintain our temperatures under 18 degrees C in order to avoid a lot of those issues you heard about earlier with some of the other flounder species in terms of having the sex ratios skewed towards the slower growing males. So uh, <clears throat> we don't have numbers to put on exactly what our sex ratios are coming out of it, but it is heavily skewed to the female side of things by just adhering to that rule of not exceeding 18 C. And because we're in Miami, we really don't have an issue of getting too cold so to speak, in our level rearing. Uh, nursery stage begins with about seven centimeter juveniles, stock in the nursery system, and then grow out stage typically begins when they're about 12 centimeters. And then this is uh, sort of how they do it in South Korea. They'll stock each tank with about 20,000 20, juveniles. And then harvest size is about 0.9 to 1.1 kilos average market size fish. And they get that in about a year, year to year and a half. So. Uh, good growth on this fish, fairly straightforward production. When it comes to the rearing systems, uh, South Korea, they use <clears throat> flow-through systems mostly. Uh, you see a typical production tank there. Again, even if you have, everything's measured in meters squared, as, as you heard earlier in some of the finer presentations. So good bottom coverage. Depth is not as important as just coverage, square footage, square meters. Uh, typically use octagonal tanks or just square tanks around the corners. Uh, you can pack the tanks in there, relatively easy to maintain, flow through systems. In the US, we wouldn't be able to do that. Okay, it's an exact species, so we need to use RAS systems capable of handling high density marine fish culture. And as with any species, sort of this is, this is the caveat with this one. So it sounds like, hey, this is ready to go, and it is ready to go, 
but we need systems that can handle this high density marine fish culture in a RAS setting. So in terms of ranking the fish and what makes it commercially ready, it's already being co produced commercially by hundreds of farms. So yes, it's commercially ready. It has very well understood biology with numerous favorable production attributes. It has a relatively small genome, so it's a good model to develop genomic breeding and further improve the commercial performance. Uh, we have high survival throughout different growth stages. And we have better growth compared to other domestic flounder species working with this one. It has an ability to be grown at high densities. So again, how do you, if you have a very expensive marine research system, the only way to actually make that work under a business setting is to have a high value fish and one that can be grown at high densities. So this seems to be one of the more promising candidates for that. And it has an established market presence. Okay, so one of the advantages with an olive flounder, it can be marketed as simply flounder. Or if you're in a sushi or sashimi setting, it can be marketed as yurame. Okay, so it has that flexibility legally. Selective breeding, so a number of research efforts on selectively bred strain of the species beginning in 2004. You can see this is a paper you can look up online. Just some of the basic differences there. In terms of the size, selected strain for rapid growth, you see the differences, just eyeballing it there. And in terms of the market, I mentioned the market size, about 0.9 to 1.1 kilos. We see this in about one year from egg to market size under optimal conditions. And you'll see some reports out there from areas where this species is grown, and they do have cooler temperatures, which is going to slow that growth down, maybe stretch it out to about a year and a half. But in general, if things are optimal, you can get it to market size in a year. Current market value is high. As you see there, this is uh, some market data, almost $20 a pound for live fish. Ikijime, almost $15 a pound. Diseases and prevention, so general straightforward treatments here as far as formalin, freshwater baths, oxytet if needed for different issues, fairly similar to other fish species. Uh, somebody mentioned earlier about Edward's celiosis. Uh, that's, that's one of the ones that can be an issue, but again, if you're keeping the tanks clean, have good biosecurity protocols in place, using best management practices, it hasn't really been an issue on any large scale for this species, uh, but this, these are a lot of the species that are, uh, they see over in Southeast Asia in terms of uh, producing this fish. And then feeds, historically the majority of feeds used in South Korea have been moist pellets, so they call farm-made feed, so sort of ground up fish, big blocks of frozen fish, mixed in with uh, proprietary blends of vitamins and minerals, and they sort of have a, a moist pellet that comes out, moist sausages, and they'll feed them to the fish. So as you can imagine, there are a number of disease and environmental risks when using that sort of thing, and water pollution can lead to other issues. Have higher FCRs, about three to one using that. So folks have now moved to extruded feeds. There have been some uh, studies done. <coughs> Lee et al., 2016, looking at some of this stuff, uh, offering better performance, as you might imagine. Uh, lower FCRs, about 1.2 to one. Reduced water pollution, reduced disease, disease risk. Uh, However, raw material supply is limited in the region. So perhaps in the U.S. we may have an advantage there. Depends on how you look at the issue. High cost of extruded feeds, right? If folks have been using a moist diet with trash fish mixed in with their, their sort of farm-made feed, there may be some reluctance to start buying a high cost feed. But in general, I th we see this as where the industry is moving for flounder production. High quality commercial extruded feeds have been developed specifically for olive flounder. Higashimaru was here in the trade show. I don't know if any of you stopped by there. They produce a olive flounder specific diet, very high quality. Okay, Biomar, there are others as well. Uh, feeds are available abroad, but the cost of importing to US is significant as you may imagine. But we've had, uh, <clears throat> we've used general marine grower diets with pretty good success, uh, pretty good performance on our fish so far. So in terms of research at UM, we're, we're aimed at removing the barriers to commercialization of this fish in, in the U.S. We're doing some seafood market research, okay, trying to put some data behind a lot of these anecdotal aspects of, 
of, yeah, the chefs love it. Well, how much do they love it, right? What are they willing to pay? How many are they willing to take each week? So these sorts of things. Looking at improvements in production efficiency at different stages. Conducting some high-density trials. So we've conducted some trials where we've exceeded 75 kilos per meter squared harvest density. No, uh, no ill effects on the fish or the systems. Uh, feeding trials comparing different commercially available diets. We conducted these at different life stages. We see FCRs of 1.1 to 1.8, depending on the life stage and the diet. We've worked with some commercial partners overseas. Some, uh, you may have seen this in the news, some flounder culture. Nassau in the Bahamas, going out fingerlings from UM. They see growth from fingerling to 1 to 1.5 kilos in 12 months. They'll actually have some of these fish at the Boston Seafood Show next week. All of flounder culture in Turkey, uh, Kilic, one of the largest, world's largest sea brim sea bass producers. Uh, starting to get into some olive flounder culture. And then we see niche market opportunities as well. Okay, live hirame. This is how it's seen. There's a restaurant just opened up in New York. You can fish and catch your own uh, hirame right there. Probably costs you about $100, but you can do it. Value-added initiatives. Uh, Jeju Island, they've, they've come up with some of these ideas. Jeju garlic flounder, the golden olive flounder. The golden olive flounder will be at the seafood show. So if you're interested in that, you can go see it there. And then plate size whole fish, right? This is uh, in Peru. This is a very uh, popular presentation taken by excellent photography there, Eduardo. Um, <coughs> with that, we see our future directions for the U.S. Pilot scale commercial production in RAS. Cost effective production, okay? So if we're pushing these high densities in marine recircling systems, we, can't, we have to have a system that still allows the producer to make money, okay? It is a high value fish. But from what we've seen so far, a lot of these systems, people come in, spend 10, 15, 20 million dollars on a marine recircling system, and number one, it probably doesn't get the densities that they think it's going to get, and they can never make that money back. So we need to have some, this is more of an engineering issue, and sort of echoes some of what the other presenters have said already. We need, we can produce commercial scale quantities of these fingerlings all day. We need a place to grow them out. We need people to step up and say, okay, I have a farm, I need to stock it. How many fingerlings do you need? We also need to develop high quality yet economical feeds, okay? So that's something we're working on. Also some vaccines, medicines, and improvements in the production systems. None of this would be possible without the support of our uh, industry partners here or the hard work and dedication of the students, staff, volunteers, and faculty at uh, UM. Thank you.